In December 1972, two astronauts climbed the ladder of a lunar module, looked back one last time at the surface of the moon, and left. That was the end of Apollo 17, and the end of human footprints on another world. We had done it, not once, but six times, and then we stopped. It's been over 50 years. In that time, we've created smartphones, self-driving cars, reusable rockets, and even artificial intelligence. Our telescopes can see galaxies billions of light years away. And yet, we still haven't returned to the one place we already conquered. But why? People often assume we didn't need to go back, that the mission was accomplished. But the truth is, the moon was never the end goal. It was supposed to be the beginning, a stepping stone to Mars, to space colonies, to a future that never quite arrived. Now, decades later, we're trying again. NASA's Artemis program is aiming to return humans to the lunar surface. But progress has been slow, filled with delays, complications, and engineering puzzles that seem harder now than they were in the 1960s. How is that even possible? The truth is more complex than most people realize, and to understand why going back is so difficult, we first need to understand how we did it the first time. In an era when computers filled entire rooms and slide rules were still in use, NASA achieved something that seemed unimaginable, landing humans on the moon and bringing them back safely. Apollo 11 was not just a triumph of courage, it was a masterpiece of simplicity, precision, and audacity. The key was the Saturn V rocket. Standing 363 feet tall, it remains the most powerful rocket ever successfully flown. It had one job, to launch all the components of the mission, command module, service module, and lunar module into space in a single shot. No space stations, no docking with external fuel tanks, no mid-mission refueling. Everything was pre-packaged, perfectly timed, and executed in one streamlined sequence. After launch, the spacecraft orbited Earth once, then fired its third stage to head for the Moon. Upon arrival, the lunar module detached and descended with two astronauts aboard. Once their mission was complete, the ascent stage blasted off to rejoin the command module in lunar orbit. Then they flew home. It was all done in one go. No relay systems, no modular handovers, just one rocket, one mission, one flawless plan. And perhaps that's what's so hard to understand today, how something so massive, so distant, could be done with such clean simplicity. Compared to modern lunar mission plans, Apollo now looks almost elegant. But in today's world, going back isn't as simple as repeating the past. Because this time, we're not just aiming to visit we're aiming to stay. If Apollo was a direct flight, Artemis is more like a city commute with multiple transfers, and each one must happen flawlessly, hundreds of thousands of kilometers from Earth. Let's break it down. The Artemis 3 mission isn't just one rocket. It's a relay of vehicles, companies, and technologies. First, NASA's massive space launch system, SLS, carries the Orion crew capsule into orbit. Orion then performs a translunar injection barn to head toward the moon. But here's where it gets complicated. Orion can't land on the moon. Instead, it will dock with a waiting lander in lunar orbit, likely a modified SpaceX starship. That starship, however, will have been launched separately, much earlier. And even before that, it needs to be refueled in Earth orbit by multiple other starships functioning as tanker ships. Each tanker flight must launch, rendezvous, transfer fuel in microgravity, and return. All of these parts, Orion, Starship, fuel tankers, must align like clockwork. If any one link in the chain breaks, the mission stalls. Imagine calling an Uber, taking a train, then hopping a helicopter in space. It's a far cry from the self-contained Apollo missions. But there's a reason it's this complicated, and it's not just for show. Because this time, we're not just landing on the moon, we're building a pathway to stay there, and that changes everything. It's a question that comes up often. If Apollo worked, why not just copy it? The answer is simple. We don't just want to touch the moon and leave. 
This time, we want to build something that lasts, a sustainable presence, a stepping stone to Mars and beyond. In the 1960s, the goal was symbolic, land on the moon before the Soviets and come home safely. That mission required only a short stay and minimal equipment. But Artemis is different. It's designed for longer durations, greater mobility, and far more scientific exploration. That means bigger payloads, heavier equipment, and more supplies. You can't do all that with one rocket. Instead of a single launch, Artemis relies on a multi-phase architecture. Separate systems for launch, transit, landing, and even future surface habitats. Building infrastructure in space, such as a lunar orbiting station called Gateway, requires flexibility, modularity, and repeated missions. And that introduces complexity. Each added goal, staying longer, carrying more, preparing for Mars, multiplies the engineering and logistical challenges. Apollo was a sprint, Artemis is a marathon. So no, we can't just do Apollo again, because the moon isn't the finish line anymore. It's the starting point. In the 1960s, going to the moon wasn't just a scientific pursuit, it was a geopolitical weapon. The United States was locked in a cold war with the Soviet Union, and space was the new battlefield. After the shock of Sputnik and Yuri Gagarin's historic flight, America was desperate to catch up. The Apollo program wasn't just about reaching the moon, it was about proving global dominance. And so, the money flowed. At its peak, NASA commanded nearly 4.5% of the entire federal budget. That's more than 20 times its share today. Thousands of contractors, hundreds of thousands of employees, and an entire national industry were mobilized. Timelines were aggressive, risks were tolerated. Because failure wasn't just technical, it was political. Today, NASA's budget hovers around 0.5% of federal spending. That's not a lack of interest, it's a shift in priorities. With no Cold War pressure, no rival superpower racing us to the moon, urgency has faded. Political support comes and goes with elections. Long-term projects get delayed, defunded, or restructured with changing administrations. Even when the will exists, the money rarely matches. Back then, space was a battlefield. Now, it's a business case. And space missions today must compete with roads, healthcare, climate policy, and defense spending. In the age of Apollo, you could throw money at a problem until it went away. Today, space programs must justify every dollar and every delay. If the Saturn V was so powerful, so successful, why did we stop using it? The short answer, it died with Apollo. When the moon missions ended, there was no plan to continue using Saturn V. The political appetite had vanished, and with it, the funding. Production lines were shut down. Blueprints were archived or lost. The specialized contractors that built its parts dissolved. The engineers who designed it retired or passed away. By the 1980s, resurrecting Saturn V would have meant starting from scratch. But even more importantly, Saturn V was designed for a different era, with different technologies. It was powerful, yes, but also expensive, single-use, and inflexible. It didn't align with modern priorities like reusability, modularity, and long-term infrastructure. Rebuilding Saturn V today wouldn't just be nostalgia, it would be inefficient. Like restoring an old steam locomotive to run a high-speed rail network, the spirit might be the same, but the world has changed. Instead, today's rockets are trying to blend raw power with modern capability. The space launch system borrows heavily from shuttle-era parts. SpaceX's Starship aims for full reusability. But no single rocket has yet matched the clean brute force of Saturn V. It was a product of its time, one we may never fully replicate. And, in many ways, we no longer want to. Because our biggest challenge now isn't building the biggest rocket, it's managing the biggest risks. In the 1960s, danger was part of the job description. The Apollo astronauts knew the risks. They climbed into a rocket that had never flown humans before, aimed at a world no one had ever walked on, and did it with confidence and a touch of recklessness. 
When Apollo 1 caught fire on the launch pad during a test in 1967, killing three astronauts, the program paused but didn't stop. The public mourned, the engineers regrouped, and just two years later, humans were walking on the moon. Today, the stakes feel different. Since the Challenger explosion in 1986 and the Columbia disaster in 2003, public and political tolerance for risk has dramatically changed. A single failure can set a program back by years, if not end it entirely. Safety protocols have multiplied. Every component must pass thousands of tests, simulations, and verifications. And if something goes wrong, even slightly, the whole system grinds to a halt. That's not cowardice, it's culture. Back then, exploration was a national imperative. Now, it's a shared global ambition, but one where human life is weighed with a different scale. No one wants to see another crew lost in space. But the price of extreme caution is time, money, and momentum. Space is still dangerous. It always will be. But how we manage that danger has changed. And with it, the timeline to return. Because in today's world, the mission isn't just to go. It's to come back, safe, every time. It was supposed to launch in 2024. Now, it's looking more like 2026, maybe later. Artemis III, like many modern megaprojects, is learning a painful truth. Complexity breeds delay. Take Orion's heat shield, for example. Designed to protect astronauts during re-entry at speeds nearing 25,000 miles per hour, it's one of the most critical parts of the spacecraft. But recent tests showed unexpected erosion patterns, ones that engineers couldn't predict. Fixing it isn't as simple as patching a hole. It requires redesigning, retesting, and recertifying the entire system. That single issue alone caused a two-year delay. And that's just one piece. Space projects today involve hundreds of contractors, subsystems, and government agencies. One delay ripples through the entire timeline. And it's not just NASA. Around the world, large-scale engineering efforts from nuclear plants to metro lines to aircraft carriers are hitting the same wall. More regulations, tighter safety margins, and supply chains stretched thin. Back in the Apollo era, things were approved faster, built quicker, and tested in real time. Today, everything is more careful, more cautious, and infinitely more complicated. Even with all our advancements, the road to the moon is slower now. Not because we're less capable, but because the world we build in has changed. And yet, despite the delays, the vision remains. Because what waits on the other side of these challenges might just be worth it. In 1962, President John F. Kennedy stood before a crowd at Rice University and spoke the words that would define a generation. We choose to go to the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. That spirit of striving, risking, reaching was the heartbeat of Apollo, and now it's being reborn in Artemis. Yes, the path is harder now, the systems are more complex, the politics more tangled, the budgets tighter, the risks weighed more cautiously. But the ambition? It's bigger than ever. Because this time, we're not just planting flags, we're building foundations, habitats, rovers, power stations, permanent structures that will turn the moon from a destination into a frontier. And from there, we look outward, to Mars, to the asteroids, to the stars. It won't be quick, it won't be easy, but it will be ours. And if we do it right, future generations won't look back and ask, why did it take so long to return? They'll ask, how did we ever leave? <laughs>